Ukraine is a mess. Don't blame Donald Trump for that. Well, you know, one minute. Come on. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Welcome back to War and Peace. I'm your host, Olga Olaker, here in my COVID-19 temporary attic studio, distanced from my co-host, Hugh Pope, and I'm in northern Brussels in my dressing room. And our distinguished guest today, Orja Zertelli, who is the president of the OSCE, the Organization uh, for Security and Cooperation in Europe, Parliamentary Assembly. Welcome, Mr. President. I'm very pleased to, to be uh, your guest, and uh, thank you for having me. I'm no, also we're... in, in Georgia, in Belize, uh, in my room, you know, <laughs> as everybody, I think, at this time. Mr. President, I'm not sure that all of our listeners I expect that they are all familiar with the OSCE. They might be less familiar with the Parliamentary Assembly. Can you talk a little bit about what the role of the Parliamentary Assembly is, just to give us some background? Okay. Of course, I think it's important to explain what we are doing and what the organization, how it's functioning. You said OSCE is quite well known, and I think Parliamentary Assembly is a very important part of the organization, one of the main institutions. OSCP itself was established almost 30 years ago. It regularly brings together over 300 members of national parliaments of 57 OSCE participating states, along with members from countries with the status of partners. So we have also other group of partners in the Mediterranean and in Asia. So we have also working also in other regions beyond the actual OSCE borders. The main idea is to support parliamentary dialogue by meeting and debating several times a year. We are organizing frequent visits to advance our OSC agenda, take part in fact-finding field visits, hear reports from our special representatives and our statutory committees. And one of the main functions of this organization also to observe election processes mm -hmm. throughout the OSC area, which covers a large part of the Northern Hemisphere. We uh, used to say that, or indicate sometimes, that we are representing over 1 billion people in this region and it's stretched from Canada to Russia. You know, it's mostly uh, well known by this statement that OSCE is uh, the big part uh, of the Northern Hemisphere from Vancouver to Vladivostok. Maybe a little bit old fashioned already, maybe other parts of geography we can use, uh, but uh, it still works. When it comes to this time and at this moment, this crisis generated by COVID 19 has appended most of our activities. That's something we wanted to ask you about, actually. It certainly changed how we work. How does it change your meetings? Have you shifted to entirely to online format? Was that difficult to do with people everywhere? First, we think about our offices and headquarters where we have our staff, our people. First, about health situation, which is quite good so far, and I don't think that there are other threats. So we have two offices in Copenhagen and in, uh, in Vienna. And because of this pandemic, as many any international organizations and maybe everybody, we also fully switched to telecommunications, the virtual meetings. I told you that we planned those months, very important conferences and gather. For instance, it was in Istanbul about economic cooperation along Silk Road. Then in Cyprus, we also been organizing big anti-corruption conference. Then we had also our fall meeting in San Marino discussing priorities of the OSP. And finally, we planned in July our biggest and most important meeting when we are adopting all the resolutions, which are coming up after all the discussions through the year in Vancouver, in Canada. Fortunately, all of them are canceled, they are postponed. And we now are trying to somehow substitute all our activities online. And uh, we are organizing parliamentary web dialogues, which give an opportunity to all our members of the Parliamentary Assembly to hear from experts on, on given topics and exchange ideas and best practices. The, some of our meetings in the forms of webinars already have featured conversations on an economic crisis generated by pandemic, as well as also consequences on a safeguard of human rights, which is also a very important topic for us, on the impact of the crisis on conflicts. OECD OSCE has a three major dimensions, so three major priorities, which are considered as a parts of holistic approach of security. So, as we call it, comprehensive security, so the political, military, economic cooperation and environment, and human rights and democratic institutions. So, we're trying to follow up all the priorities 
now online and then as i said in forms of webinars and web dialogues trying to collect also information successful experiences from all over the C region which could enable members of parliament to make more informed decisions replicate positive measures facilitate sharing of vital information to people that represent their constituencies and also we are trying to encourage parliaments and parliamentarians be active because they have to play a role and a significant role in times of crisis and i think that's important clearly the parliamentary assembly has a very important information sharing function between your 57 member states but you've also kind of setting norms at this time of stress and crisis with covid-19 i mean you've been putting out statements in and pressure for media and democratic freedoms for truthful statements by governments for keeping the internet open for combating disinformation and for making sure that governments remember that data security is also a, a right for their citizens. And we've seen this have an impact in some places like Armenia, for instance, uh, where uh, it pushed for a more open discussion of the pandemic. Can you give us any other examples where your pressure has brought some improvement to the situation? You're right. They're trying also to make quite a few public statements. Of course, it's not only number is important, but a content is important. The issues are important. It should be relevant to the OEC in the current situation. When it comes to particular countries, I'd like to say that in those times, there was important also to know where are most vulnerable, let's say, sides of this pandemic, which countries they need help and support. And we're also trying to use our networks and connect countries, connect different governments or even sometimes the companies. But I can can also put forward some examples of that. But as you mentioned, freedom of speech, or you mentioned more open discussions in the parliament. So encouraging parliaments and parliamentarians to be active, not to shut down their work and to be represented in their duties, I think that's, of course, opening space for discussions, is opening space for exchange of ideas in the societies, because what is happening quite often in the times of emergencies and the times of curfews, which we're observing in many countries, of course, the threat curtailing democratic principles, and first of all, the media freedom, there's always danger of that. So we are not only independently working on those issues, but we're complementing also work of our media freedom representative. You know that we have a special institutions in the OSCE, it's a media freedom representative who is very actively involved now and uh, vigilant on all the issues. For instance, if you see the statements on uh, Kyrgyz law, the Kyrgyzstan law on uh, counterterrorism, which also contains threat to, let's say, diminish and curtail so some media freedom activities and also could be different sanctions against media. So there was a quite a sharp reaction from the OEC. Uh, there is also a good uh, example, for instance, in Kazakhstan, uh, just uh, recently they made a decision in the parliament to decriminalize defamation, which mm -hmm. I think it was a, quite a long time issue and we criticized and we came up with suggestions to do that. In, in some also Central Asian countries, we know that they are following this trend. There were some critical views and statements on Turkey when it comes also on the media freedom and some sanctions and a narrowing, let's say, space for freedom and expression and at times of COVID. So there are many, many others, uh, you know, that uh, we have a permanent disagreement, I see, uh, with Russia. When it comes also uh, fake information or hiding information or, uh, let's say, manipulating with the numbers, the cases in different countries. So we try to be also vigilant on those issues. And sometimes, as I said, it's a quite productive work. So we also could continue to do so and maintain uh, some of the key issues high also in our political agenda. And uh, what I'd like to say again, we also in the Parliamentary Assembly, we sort to be as useful as possible for the citizens by using some of the connections we made through the ACPAs to activate formal channel. It's, it's always very important when we are tackling this crisis. For instance, just a particular case, in our web dialogues, uh, we invited many speakers. And uh, when we started with Italy, because Italy was very severely affected, one of the most affected first European country, we invited president of Lombardy region, which was the center of COVID outbreak in Italy and Europe. And we had a very sincere discussion with him about the problematic issues. And he also asked the Parliamentary Assembly of OSC to help with the medical equipment, with the different goods that they need. And uh, 
Through the series of contacts, we also managed to connect uh, Lombardy region with the uh, Kazakhstan authorities and some ca- Kazakh companies. They helped then Italy, and there was a quite, uh, in a short time, a special equipment shipped from mm-hmm. Kazakhstan to Milan. That's the particular case when we can say that beyond some political debates and discussions and sometimes maybe boring dialogues, or the reports that we are hearing from different countries, there are particular issues could be solved through this multilateral cooperation. I'm not saying about the general messages that we are standing out as a political organization and as an institution. So a number of elections have been postponed as a result of the response uh, and the effort to slow the spread of the COVID-19 virus. How concerned should people be? Where are you most concerned about postponed elections and votes and potential that this could have negative repercussions down the line? And what can the OSC Parliamentary Assembly do when it is concerned? Thank you for this question. As I mentioned before, election observation is one of the main priorities and a field of work for the OSC and OSC parliamentarians. Since 1993, OSCP played a leading role in observing elections across the OSC area in cooperation, first of all, with our main institutions, ODIR. Everybody knows Mm -hmm. I think this organization is uh, is Office of Democratic Institutions and Human Rights. And we are still very closely working with them also in in a pandemic time. And these missions help to ensure that all the universal values upheld by the OSC and participating states, which are enshrined in Helsinki Final Act and the Copenhagen document, that are founding documents for OSC activities. They are better known. They should be better known, understood, uh, also accepted and shared. That's the idea. It also continues to strengthening uh, international commitments to democracy, to rule of law and human rights. And all the participating states, being members of this organization, they took this responsibility when they signed this agreement and joined the organization. So it should be kept. Parliamentarians' engagement, of course, it's important. They have a greater expertise and accountability and visibility of election observation. So... As you said, I myself, being a politician, I'm thinking what will be tomorrow with elections, because also in my own country with the elections in autumn, it's scheduled. In some countries, we had already prepared teams for that, and there was a lot of organizational work done, but it postponed in North Macedonia, in Serbia, so we're expecting new dates. But uh, certainly, pandemic also had a huge impact on elections and election observation. We're still unsure how we can proceed with it, because it's absolutely new. We don't even know how people will vote. Yeah, we don't know how they'll vote, so it's hard to know how to observe. Even even I'm not sure myself uh, if my rights to campaign can be affected by prolonged restrictions on public gatherings or and the enforcement of social distancing. I mean, I think in many countries, in many societies, these questions are existential. That's that's a reality. For example, could these restrictions be used uh, by authorities to undermine the opposition? which is a realistic threat. And this is something that the OSC will want to be keeping an eye on, yeah? Absolutely, and then some countries are already making adjustments to their electoral practices to ensure that elections go ahead, and we will continue to remain vigilant on whether these changes meet democratic standards. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. So you are listening to War and Peace, and we are speaking with Georgia Tseratelli, the president of the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly. Mr. President, I'm wondering if you believe that the COVID-19 crisis and the measures we've taken in response is going to change the way that the OSCE and the Parliamentary Assembly work for the long term. That's one of the most important questions for all the organizations, mm-hmm. of course, for us, how we could come out from this uh, crisis and also stay as a relevant organization, as a functional organization. And it also touches maybe another problem of multilateral affairs and uh, how multilateral organizations will function, how it could affect also geopolitics. There are Many thoughts, many scenarios discussed at this moment. But what I'd like to also add, uh, what I said before, we are talking about economic recovery now. It will be necessary after this pandemic is over. But there's also the need to consider the democratic recovery. 
I'd like to emphasize mm -hmm. that also uh, taking into consideration the election processes and the democratic developments in many countries. So that will be a tough issue. When it comes to OEC itself as an important institution for the European security and also multilateral, this organization is founded uh, on a model of, as I've already mentioned, a comprehensive security. Also, the pandemic impacted all our main dimensions. What the OSC offers is a deep understanding of what European security means and how important it is to address all those pillars, political, military, or environmental, and economic, and human rights. All those are more, very important directions. Because the PA is a reflection of also national legislatures. Our delegations offer reflect also diversity of parliament. And in the past decade, more and more our members have come from different political parties. Also, there are populists, there are nationalists. So that's a different, very colorful composition. And it sometimes also it's reflected in our work. That's a very important point, isn't it, Mr. President? Because one of the main impacts we've seen so far in the world from the pandemic has been an acceleration of this feeling that countries are turning in on themselves, that multilateralism is falling by the wayside. And obviously, the Organization of Security and Cooperation, you're very much a child of uh, another generation. Do you think that the OSCE is going out of date? Or does your very deep contact with all those members around these 57 countries mean that you're seeing a new kind of multilateralism develop? It's a good question. It also depends, of course, on the actors, and it depends on the countries and their decisions and their leaders. Of course, this pandemic has the, the high potential to deepen also existing rifts also within our assembly. Even prior to this crisis, we had already noticed as sharp disagreements regarding the role of China. We have a permanent disagreements with Russia, the role of the United States and a big power. Here is a, also European Union with its uh, ideas, ambitions, and a main ambition also to strengthen multilateralism. In particular, when it comes to, for instance, uh, when I'm talking about China, when it comes to infrastructure investments in OSCE region, the last time in a one one of the biggest bureau meetings, I asked bureau members what could be priority for the next year. It's even before pandemic and it's before all those uh, dramatic developments. And most of our bureau members, they said that we'd like to discuss China as a priority and a Chinese influence on economy and the political play and all the stuff. So this is still here. It uh, didn't vanish. And I think after the crisis, it might be more discussions. And as I said, could be more rifts or it could be more cooperation. It depends on a goodwill, uh, understanding of the problem by the participating countries and the leaders. And we as a parliamentary assembly, we try, of course, to deliver right message and to promote and to encourage the idea of multilateralism because we see also in this pandemic that no any country could solve the problem alone. You saw that first time, for instance, Iran asked IMF for financial help. It's never happened before. But the countries, they need cooperation. They need to assist each other. And that's very understandable at this moment. But uh, there are different uh, questions. Also, the transatlantic discussions are very important. And it should be active, uh, United States and Canada. When I'm talking about our web dialogues, I'm very thankful to our U.S. colleagues dedicating their time to the discussions with this contributing to the multilateralism and strengthening those ties between U.S. and Europe. And in recent weeks, it's very evident for us. And there are also some uh, particular cases, if you are interested, I can just uh, sort of tell you one of that. Why is important also our communication uh, with Washington, uh, and it's particularly in the times when pillars of uh, multilateralism are under the threat. For instance, there were recently talks about the U.S. withdrawing from Open Sky Street. Mm -hmm. There was a big discussion, yes. which has been a it's vital still, instrument. It's still not clear what's going to happen, yeah. Yeah, a vital instrument for confidence building and military transparency. And this is a treaty that lets countries overfly each other's territories and just see what's going on. Yeah, I mean, that just so if listeners don't know, it's been very, very valuable. Magically important. And I tell you that, for instance, European... You know that European countries and nations continue to defend the treaty as a valuable tool. And particularly our members, our delegation, I would not name them, 
is a 15 or 17, 17 congressmen and senators. But not, of course, all of them, but some of them, and especially the Helsinki Commission, they have echoed these concerns, organized special hearings, and called for robust consultations, which would prevent hasty withdrawal. Just a one example also of good cooperation on specific security or, uh, let's say, <clears> the <throat> security or military issue. We try to be very active in coming also weeks and months. And especially as the president, our secretary general, uh, we will start beyond this, uh, besides of these webinars and web dialogues, to reach out to all the regional leaders and uh, delegations with the Balkans, Central Asia, different European regions, and have directly conversations with them on their problems, on their ways out, and how Parliamentary Assembly will be helpful. So this is also strengthening the message of multilateralism, which I think is essential. One of the successes you referred to was relating to your ability to broker an agreement between Kazakhstan and Lombardy. I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the phenomenon around the edges of the former Soviet Union, the five breakaway states that uh, we often hear about from Transnistria to South Ossetia to Nagorno-Karabakh. These are areas which will probably be very severely affected by the pandemic. Is there anything that the OSCE can do as an umbrella organization to help these isolated people, to bring them a little bit back into the mainstream? Well, a uh, good question. One one of the biggest headaches of uh, OSC and also parliamentary assembly the situation in conflict areas, especially now uh, when this pandemic is spread everywhere. And uh, we know that in those places and the conflict areas, risk is always high for the local populations because of the lack of rule of law, because of different unlawful activities, because of in, in specific areas, uh, of course, uh, pressure from undemocratic regimes and in countries like my own country I can tell about the breakaway regions and Abkhazian Ossetia and Russian influence there. And this influence at this moment not always helped or a medical assistant or financial assistance, but even restricting regimes. Of course, we have a quite a fragile peace in Nagorno-Karabakh. You mentioned about this regard between Azerbaijan and Armenia and, of course, Ukraine, where still shootings and ceasefire violations are going on. Our SMM, and it's one of the biggest mission of the OSC on the ground, they are, of course, recording everything and they have uh, almost every day reports there. So situation is still quite grave and we are in permanent contact with our Ukrainian colleagues, the members of delegation and updating what's happening on the ground. At this moment, of course, we are limited. Even in peace, in a relatively I mean, peaceful, I mean, not pandemic times, we were quite limited to go there to organize fact-finding missions, you know, that Khazi and Ossetia are refusing always uh, to accept any international organizations to go there. Even UMM, EU monitoring mission, is very limited. So the lack of information at this moment and the uh, situation the, with the democratic principles, discrimination of people there, of course, it's increasing dramatically risks for the populations of contracting the virus and then also very, very limited medical facilities, education of the staff, medical doctors. I'd like to thank you and your organization for your very comprehensive and very important report, which was revealed, released recently on Abkhazia and Ossetia, which is a very good example, you know, how this situation, pandemic, even make life more difficult and to aggravate situation on the ground for people who live under occupation and uh, living in these conflict areas. And as a Georgian, I'd like to thank you, but as also as a head of international institutions, because what is a lack at this moment in the world, and also for us, it's information, it's a reliable information, it's a information based on facts, because we are living also in, in an ocean of fake news around. As you know, and it's proved by many sources that unfortunately, Russia is still quite active in spreading not very reliable information uh, in the world. There is a lot of not very reliable information out there. I mean, it's coming from a variety of sources, I have to say, as an American. But a few months ago, I, I appointed a special representative to tackle disinformation and fake news. It's uh, our colleague from San Marino. San Marino is also quite affected by pandemic. I think in coming uh, maybe weeks, we should have to expect 
maybe special report from our special representative on the situation of fake news in OAC area, which will be, I think, interesting piece. I think it will be very interesting. So we are out of time. I want to thank you, Mr. President, for joining us. I want to thank you also for noting our new report, a COVID-19 challenge in post-Soviet breakaway statelets, which does indeed look at Abkhazia and South Ossetia, as well as Nagorno-Karabakh, Transnistria, and the parts of the Donbass that the Ukrainian government does not currently control. It's available on our website. But Mr. Rosen, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to, to be with you. Thank you. This has been War and Peace, a podcast of the International Crisis Group, also part of the Europod network. Big thanks to Bull Media, who produces us, and Miranda Sunnux, who coordinates everything to do with this podcast. War and Peace a podcast by the International Crisis Group.